Hello, and welcome to this presentation on Leonardo's Virgin of the Rocks, as seen through the eyes of a fourth-way student. Let's open with a quote from Ospensky. All study, all thinking and investigation must have one aim, one purpose in view, and this aim must be attaining consciousness. Leonardo was indeed studying, thinking, and investigating throughout his life. Was this his aim? Consciousness? We know that Leonardo was a genius, and his talent certainly extended to many fields, such as anatomy, biology, mechanics, invention, and painting. He had an unlimited curiosity about the world around him. But let's consider this theory that not only was he a genius, but he was perhaps a conscious man. Similar to a conscious teacher, such as Jesus or Buddha, perhaps at a different level and with a different role to play, but a man who attained a superior level of consciousness way beyond that of an ordinary person. In the fourth way system, we say that a human being is like a caterpillar that has the possibility of becoming a butterfly. And through long efforts at transformation, he can develop higher centers to the point that they crystallize into a permanent body that can survive the death of the physical body. Our theory today is that Leonardo was such a man. So if we follow this idea, then what messages could he have left behind in his works? Did he have that aim in view like Ospensky, attaining and perhaps transmitting consciousness? Was he looking at the world with consciousness, not with ordinary curiosity, but trying to discover the nature of the creator in order to know himself? And did he leave a map behind? To unlock the secrets of conscious art, we must put ourselves into a state similar to the one the artist was in and the state he was trying to portray. The system tells us that we have in us higher centers that can be awakened through spiritual practice. This awakening gives us access to states of consciousness that are very different from our ordinary state. The practice of self-remembering is the method for opening these higher centers. Self-remembering is also called divided attention. It's the practice of di dividing one's attention between the sensation of I am, I exist, with whatever's taking place in the moment. So right now we can try and divide attention between looking at this painting of the Mona Lisa while simultaneously holding that sensation, I am, I am here, I am looking. She seems to be looking back at us in the same state. And maybe looking at her helps us to hold and expand our state. And likewise, our state of self-remembering seems to bring her more to life. So let's look at the painting. This work was a commission that Leonardo was carrying out. The painting on the left, which is in Paris now, was the first one. It is said that he kept it with him for about 10 years, continuously working it and revising it. When he finally delivered the commission, there was some misunderstanding as to the price, and so he turned around and sold it to someone else. They pressed him for the commission, and so he made the second painting, which is in London now. The first thing that strikes us is this unusual rocky landscape. It seems from the murky, washed out colors that it takes place at night or at some mysterious hour. 
the flowers have that colorless nighttime aspect and the body seems flushed with something like moonlight. Or perhaps dawn is breaking through the distant at the distant mountains. This is a bit more visible in the Paris painting, the darkness and the breaking light in the background. So this rocky, cavernous landscape, a cave or a grotto perhaps, what did Leonardo have in mind with such a setting? During this period, the Madonna was more traditionally portrayed on a throne such as in this painting by Raphael of the same period. Why would Leonardo put these characters in such a setting? The Virgin kneeling on the rough ground? Perhaps he was saying that nature itself is a throne, or perhaps a show of humility, or something else that we can explore. Among his numerous writings, Leonardo only left behind two passages about his personal life. The first one was an unusual count, account In the first recollection of my infancy, it seemed to me that while I was in my cradle, a kite came to me and opened my mouth with its tail and struck me several times with its tail inside my lips. The second passage, written when he was around 24 years old, was about a cave. Having wandered some distance among overhanging rocks, I came to the entrance of a dark, of a great cavern. Two emotions arose in me, fear and desire fear of the threatening dark cavern, and desire to see whether there were any marvelous things in it. In the following folio, he describes the finding of a large carcass of a great whale inside a cave. It's not completely certain whether this passage was autobiographical, but it is interesting that it follows from the first one. O oh, powerful and once living instrument of formative nature, your great strength now of no avail, you must abandon your tranquil life to obey the law which God and time gave to creative nature. Of no avail are your branching sturdy fins with which you pursued your prey, plowing your way and tearing open the briny waves with your breast. O oh, time! swift despoiler of created things. How many kings, how many peoples have you undone since this wondrous fish, form of this fish, died here in this winding and cavernous recess? Now unmade by time, you lie patiently in this closed place with bones stripped and bare, serving as an armature for the mountain placed over you. Leonardo often wrote in this manner that time and nature are at odds. Nature is always building new forms and time is constantly breaking them down. We see this in this painting of the Virgin of the Rocks with these tenuous and crumbling rocks all around. The scene is unsteady, crumbling, disintegrating and dangerous. The majestic distant mountains in the background are juxtaposed against the tiny pebbles in the foreground. Even the great mountains will eventually be broken down by time. The characters themselves are actually poised at the edge of a cliff. Jesus is just on the edge. Fortunately, the angel is holding on to him. 
Their postures also seem unsteady. Jesus casually crosses his legs on the cliff edge, while Mary and John lean forward in unbalanced gestures. Only the angel seems somewhat secure and out of danger. We see the same in the Paris version, the characters on the cliff edge. In this version, there's a small pool of water between them that separates Jesus and John. Sometimes water is said to represent knowledge. Also in this painting, the Virgin is sitting bizarrely on the lap of St. Anne, and they are again at a cliff edge with the icy blue distant mountains contrasted with the tiny pebbles crumbling under their feet. Life itself is crumbling around us. From time, the relentless destroyer of all created forms. But as time breaks down created things, is there something outside of this process? Something that survives? Perhaps the drama here with these four characters, Leonardo is showing escape from the ruins of time. The drama of spiritual work takes place in and out of time. But before we go on to discuss these characters, I would like to go back and look at the story of the cave for a moment. We know that at age 24, Leonardo left the studio of his teacher, Verrocchio, and established his own workshop that his father helped him set up. It was at this time that the description of the cave appeared in his notebook. After this, he disappeared for a period of about two years, and we have no knowledge of his whereabouts. There are speculations that Leonardo did discover something in that cave, or something happened to him there, for he seemed changed afterwards. Only a few years later, he created some surprising aerial maps. This is the city of Imola. And this, a bird's eye view of southern Tuscany. What kind of mind could create such precise aerial views? Perhaps like Muhammad, who was visited by the angel Gabriel after he went into seclusion in a cave, Perhaps Leonardo also had some transcendental experience. Maybe this landscape has a particular meaning for him. So let's look at the drama of the characters and see what they might represent in fourth way language. This is an apocryphal story of John meeting Christ as they both flee the massacre of the innocents. In fourth way terms, Mary represents the heart, the intentional heart, and the highest part of the emotional center that is the doorway to higher centers. This part of us seeks to know the meaning of existence, is drawn to beauty, mystery, and the deep questions of life. A young heart could be full of wonder and inspiration where a mature heart has attributes of discrimination, humility, compassion, and the ability to serve something higher. Jesus represents the steward, that is our will, that has the ability to control the lower centers. It can take action to stop imagination. It has the control to not express negative emotions. And generally, it takes care of the takes control of the energy of the machine. The steward and the heart work together to direct one's life to the development of higher centers. In this scene, Mary is a maiden, but already she has a strong influence. She holds a firm hand on John, who I believe here represents essence. 
Essence in its simplest sense is the essential components of our machine, like our body type and center of gravity. It's like Adam and Eve in the garden, childlike and innocent, but vulnerable and corruptible. Essence has no possibility for consciousness, but it's like a home for consciousness, and it must be gradually cleaned, organized, and purified so it can become a worthy residence. And this is what the steward does. Here Leonardo shows this relationship. Jesus blesses John. Mary has a firm hand on him, directing him toward Jesus, and John serves and reveres Jesus. Jesus is an immature child, but Leonardo depicts him here with a head more like that of a man than a baby, with a large ear and fully developed nose. Perhaps he's showing the strength of a more mature steward who gives guidance, instruction, and control to essence. We see this also depicted in the cartoon by Leonardo, with Mary the heart and Saint Anne, possibly representing the mysterious higher centers here. Mary is sitting on Saint Anne's lap, showing their united influence, which flows down through Jesus, the steward, to essence, John. Jesus kind of rises up out of the body of Mary and gives blessing and direction to John. With his left hand, Jesus takes John by the chin and lifts up his face in the direction of St. Anne's oversized hand pointing upwards to higher worlds. Jesus said, Peace on earth. The peace of consciousness flowing down and uniting all worlds. We see the same idea in this Leonardo painting. Higher centers as Saint Anne exist in a different world, icy blue, devoid of vegetation and earthly concerns. Mary, the heart, reaches out into life and embraces Jesus, who returns her gaze, showing that their effort is united. For Jesus has another role, the transformation of suffering and his ultimate sacrifice. He holds on to the sacrificial lamb whose tail shows the very end of this story. The lower self who provides the necessary friction and opposition to the steward is shown here as a kind of dragon or serpent head at the end of the tail. I hope you can see in this image, it's quite obvious in the original painting. So going back to our painting, this drama of spiritual work, the heart, steward, and essence are united in their effort in spite of the fact that they are in a very tenuous circumstances. Fortunately, they are attended by an angel, divine intervention, or what the system calls celestial or sea influence, who watches over the drama, slightly from the outside, but with a hand supporting and perhaps communicating with the steward. Sea influence is the influence that comes to earth from higher worlds. In Christian terms, this would be God, and especially the host of angels and saints that supposedly intervene on behalf of humanity. If we consider once again as a theory that there may be invisible beings that help and support our spiritual development, and without this influence, evolution would be impossible. In Christianity, saints were once living people who attained a high level of being, transformation and consciousness. After they pass from this world, they return to help in spirit or in energy form. This idea exists in most major religions. So returning to Leonardo and our theory that he was a conscious being, 
Could he now be with us in spirit form? Did he create these works of art to communicate with us? Can we reach his influence through these paintings? If we look once again at the characters, we might see that they are grouped around a kind of invisible square space or an empty cube. They are united in effort to support the existence of this invisible presence that we are seeking to establish through self-remembering. In Mary's body, there's an unusual dark square hole right in her breast that is revealed through her open cape. It's highlighted by a strange golden sash beneath. It is like a cave within a cave, perhaps the entrance to a mystical world. This dark hole is echoed in the opening behind her that shows that icy blue mountainous world. The heart is the entrance to that world through self-remembering, united effort, and outside help. Thank you for watching, and thank you, Leonardo, for your help.